Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity. You know, it's a, it's a time squeeze. I did there a lot to discuss. discuss. Uh, we have some um, and, and you know, so I'm gonna rush through certain there. slides. Please hold on. Uh, so we are gonna talk about uh, critical illness in uh, an immune suppressed host. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll try to focus my discussion particularly on an infectious disease aspect of it. This topic is so broad, uh, but just to summarize, few key aspects. Before I start, I would say that I don't have any financial disclosure to share with you. There is no conflict of interest. I'll not discuss any off-level medications and there will be no patient identifiers in my presentation. So today I'm going to design my talk around like key ob objectives, particularly focusing on these critically ill patients. I'll talk about a direct approach to the initial assessment of these patients. Uh, we'll briefly discuss about febrile neutropenia and infections associated with immunosuppressants that we give. And then finally talking about, uh, you know, infections in solid organ transplant patients with a big focus on invasive mold disease and invasive mold infections. And finally, certain non-infection etiologies that may look like infection, but not exactly infections. Um, so first about why uh, infections are Tough and why overall detection of uh, you know the infection in critically ill patient is complex is just due to so many factors. Particularly, we talk about these patients. You know they are unable to communicate. Most of the time, they are intubated. They are on the ventilator. Uh, they are in a lot of pain. They are agitated. They don't want to talk a lot about their history. They might have you know so many things going on. Um, then there are so many signs of infection which are always masked and blended with so many other things. So detection of infection just based on of signs and symptoms is get, just gets very complicated. Uh, and then again, you know, most of the time we say that, oh, we did extensive workup and it's negative. But these patients who are immune suppressed host, it is like an evolving situation. So today you did the workup, it's negative. Maybe tomorrow they are exposed to something new. And this is something uh, which may lead to further deterioration. Most of the infections, particularly, uh, are common, but there are a lot of atypical and opportunistic pathogens in these. Uh, so that makes it a bit more complex. And physicians, particularly the intensivists taking care of these patients, uh, they are working in a gray zones. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of overlap, overlapping signs and symptoms, and there's always a fear of missing out. So in that fear, they end up giving them a whole lot of very broad spectrum antibiotics, right? Thinking that antibiotic may solve everything, Rather, it may exacerbate the problem with more side effects and more drug-related antibiotic resistance down the lane. And if we are dealing with those sort of, sort of patients, we can manage them better only if we understand them better. And in order to understand them better, I'm just going to walk you through this direct approach. So this approach was shared uh, back in 2020 in Intensive Care Medicine Journal, and they named it as a direct approach. So what exactly it is? It is based on these five key aspects. Number one is focusing on the delay and time lag. That is the part of the initial evaluation that comes from the history. Like you want to evaluate how long the symptoms are there, uh, whether they were on any profile access, was there, what was the time lag between transplant and the current presentation and other relevant aspects of the history. Once we have that understanding, then we look at the very next step. What sort of immune deficiencies are there? Which arms of the immune system are impaired? And that guide us a lot and help us really better understand. The next step is radiographic appearance. Every time these patients are admitted or being evaluated in the clinic, there's always a basic data. For example, take an example of an x-ray, right? They, you may find some consolidation, air bronchogram, some sort of pleural effusion, some interstitial pattern. You get some initial idea. And then comes the exam and experience. So that is where there's a lot of variety. So physical exam has its own limitation, but with these patients, experience counts a lot. Uh, the overall clinical experience of the ICU team handling these patients is just develop their clinical insight to detect the things earlier. We were just talking about, uh, you know, the role of AI and early detection of sepsis. Previously, we used to rely a lot on these two aspects, exam and experience. And now I think this is the part where uh, AI is sort of replacing by detection of infection early by utilizing early warning system based on non, uh, natural language models. And finally, based on all that information that we get, we go to the next step, we get the better radiological pattern, which is CT scan, MRI, and PET scan. Well, if we follow the same pattern all the time in evaluation of these critically ill patients, we'll be able to manage them better. So let's talk about them one by one. Let's look at the very first aspect, which is immune deficiency. So why we are talking about this? It's significant. You see, if we look at this pie chart diagram, 
Obviously, the bacterial pneumonia and the respiratory viruses are common all across, but then there are certain things which are actually determined by what arm of the immune system is impaired. Let's take an example of neutrophil and macrophages. In case of solid organ transplant, neutropenia, MDS, AML, these are all impaired. Now, apart from the usual stuff, these sort of patients may have aspergillus, mycobacter, nocardia, mucor, and that, why we need to know that, it's just because it will help us decide what sort of diagnostic workup we need to do. If we send this diagnostic workup sooner, we can catch on these things sooner rather than later, right? The whole idea is to catch on these things within the first week. We don't want our patients to deteriorate, get more sick, and then start ordering these tests because each of these tests will have a lag time and the delay in reporting, right? And each, each one of the extensive tests and diagnostic workup is depending upon what sort of immune system is impaired. Now, the next step is looking at the timeline I was talking about. Let's take an example of a stem cell transplant. So there are so many factors that play a role that what sort of infection may develop and what's the timeline. For example, it depends on where was the graft source, what sort of conditioning regimen was used, and then whether or not a patient is in pre-transplant phase, in engraftment phase, early post-engraftment or late post-engraftment. And that is all shown in this picture where it's just so much variable how the body temperature varies and what's the cell count distribution all across. And it's the variability of the cell count distribution that determines their risk of catching certain infection. Let's say if I got a patient who is critically ill and is in engraftment phase, like just within 42 days of getting their transplant, uh, transplant. So I will be more focused on treating common bacteria, but at the same time, I will start thinking about fungal candida aspergillus, and at the same time, thinking about common viruses like HSV reactivation. Whereas if I get this patient down the lane later on, I may start thinking about reactivation of CMV, VZV, because those are atypical ones. If we miss them and don't treat them, patient will get more sick. Even though whatever amount of antibiotic you give, if you're not treating and thinking about these things, your patient will go in the wrong direction. Similarly, with the solid organ transplant, there is always a timeline that when is the when did the patient get the transplant and how many months away are evaluating them. For example, if they got sick within a month after getting transplant, you're more looking at nosocomial bacterial infection, something hospital related. If you go far beyond, let's talk about like three to four months later, that's the time where you start thinking about endemic fungal infections, toxo, cryptococcus, pneumocystis, uh, maybe tuberculosis, obviously pretty common in all phases all these things start in a picture there. The next step is better radiological imaging and better understanding. Our CT scan, obviously x-rays are there, but CT scan tell us a lot in these patients. If I have a patient who have a fever and some sort of respiratory complaints, I'm not gonna rely isolated on x-ray, I'm definitely gonna get a CT scan. And I will highlight two common abnormalities here and how these abnormalities guide me to decide what test I order right away. Let's take a look at the nodular lesions. Apart from common bacterial infections, in immune suppressed host, I should be worried about fungal. And common ones are there, but aspergillus, no cardiosis, and mycosis are life-threatening. If you don't treat them, the patient may deteriorate sooner. And similarly, ground glass opacities are pretty common with, let's say, pulmonary edema and viral pneumonia or atypical bacterial pneumonia. But think about the pneumocystis, and your diagnostic workup will go in that direction. Um, um, briefly about neut febrile neutropenia, pretty common topic. Just few common definitions and numbers are there. Obviously, if they have a fever of 100.9 at uh, one time or 100.4 for stain for one hour uh, with the presence of neutropenia, which is significant enough, let's say if less than 500 or less than 1,000 now, but over the next 48 hours, you expect that they will fall down to less than 500. So fall in that category. And typically, it happens within a week after getting a systemic uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy. And there are many etiologies. The key thing is that only 50% of the time you'll be able to find the organism. And even then, if you further say only 10 to 30% of the time they will have bacteremia, only 20 to 30% of the time you will actually find the organ system. So you are always operating 50% of the time in a gray zone. There are so many reasons they can develop an infection. And that is just shown on this uh, sequence of events. You see, as we enter the day 10 after the cytotoxic chemotherapy, they, that's the time they happen to have mucositis. That's the time where they have malabsorption. And that's when the bacteremia, catheter-related infections happen because that's the time where neutropenia is there. Uh, overall, you know, it, it depends on kind of malignancy you're dealing with that, that determines their risk of neutropenia, particularly the AML, ALL, MDS, those are the common ones, pretty much well known to cause. But when I look at the duration of neutropenia, that can also guide me whether my patient is at low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. For example, if the anticipated duration of neutropenia is less than seven days, 
in case of solid tumor chemotherapies, I will say that's a low risk patient as compared to the high risk patient, where I know that the anticipated new, uh, duration of neutropenia may be up to 14 days or two weeks. And I should prepare myself in such a way that if patient is in that subset, I should anticipate and target and treat accordingly. Now, let's say, taking an example of a patient who shows up having a febrile neutropenia, how should I go ahead? And starting with the MASCC score, what score is that? It is a score that basically tells me to actually classify these patients into certain risk category. Um, so the score actually goes in a different way. The higher the score, the lower is the risk, right? So score greater than 21. And sensitivity can reach up to 95%. Based on that MS. As MASCC score, let's say I got a risk assessment done, I will classify the patient who is acutely ill, critically ill, and MASCC score of less than 21. And if they have anticipated duration of neutropenia greater than seven, they will definitely get admitted inpatient, will get the blood cultures. And obviously, I'll start the initial antibiotic therapy. And you can depend decide about initial therapy. Primarily, the guidelines recommend cefepime, but there are certain situations when you have to go with uh, carbapenem therapy as well. Now, the treatment of gram-negative infection is common. Obviously, uh, it depends on where, where you are exactly practicing, what were the previous organism in that sort of patient, and what was the prior exposure in past 30 days. In case of my practice, where I work in an intensive care unit, all of these patients, when they get sick and admitted, I do have these uh, rapid detection tests where I don't wait for like five days to get the cultures. And depending on which body system is involved, I usually get the rapid detection method to figure out, at least identify the organism. For example, in case of the bloodstream infection, I usually get the early uh, biofire report to get the overall early detection of these. Um, similarly, respiratory, gastrointestinal, each system has its own PCR-based testing to detect the pathogen sooner rather than later. Uh, as far as, obviously, we're going to treat for gram-negative infections, but there are certain situations where you may probably have to add better coverage for staph aureus. And what are those? Guidelines really don't recommend that until unless you are, you are in one of these situations. For example, if your patient are uh, critically ill and you see there is an obvious catheter side infection, blood culture is done positive for GPC, if there's any known colonization, either in the nose like by getting a nasal MRSA swab or they are hemodynamically unstable in shock in an ICU. So they will definitely get MRSA coverage. Now, obviously these patients are frequently exposed to antibiotics. So their level of bacterial resistance will be a lot more. So now we are talking about extensively resistant gram-negative organisms that are uh, critically ill. Now, these patients uh, sometimes end up in a situation where even they have develop an infection which is carbapenem resistant. So what are our options beyond that? And this is the study which was published back in 2019, looking at type of, uh, you know, the mutation they carry, what sort of beta lactamase they have, and based on that sort of classify where we can, uh, you know, what antibiotic we can use ahead of time rather than waiting for susceptibility. Take an example of a carbapenem resistant pseudomonas in critically ill patient, right? Here, the options are really rare. Uh, if we are talking about a currently used antibiotic that I have, it's a ceftericol. Obviously, most of the places don't carry that. <clears throat> now, the fungal coverage is obviously needed in intermediate risk patient with septic shock or high risk patient, as I told you already, like AML or these patients who just got their transplant. And then I talk about adding candida coverage with mica fungin in intermediate risk and ALL patients who are in shock. At the same time, if those uh, Patients are at risk of invasive mold infection, as I'll talk in the next few slides. Instead of giving mica fungin, I would rather go for voriconazole, which has added mold coverage. And let's talk briefly a few slides about immune suppressants. I just laid this slide here to just refresh our understanding of overall the cell cycle and where all these uh, you know, immunosuppressants work. Now, the common ones that are used for conditioning are lymphocyte depleting agents, and there are two, a campath and rituxan. And they act on all these cell lines. You know, they act on, uh, if you talk specifically about CAMPAT, they talk, of, uh, they deplete T cells and B cells, and that it cells put the patient at risk of following infections. I'm not going to read through it. And similarly, when we talk about CD20 monoclonal targeting antibodies, you know, they also deplete the B cell line. Apart from the rest of the infection risk, the one key thing to remember is that they, they, they impair their immune response to vaccination. So they probably have to revaccinate later on. Similarly, anti-thymocyte globulin, they also uh, prolong the duration of lymphopenia as well. So that is the thing that we need to keep in mind. This patient remain at risk of common uh, CMP, EBV, and PTLD situation. And similarly, acrylizumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody, binds to C5 and inhibit this complex, which is C5B to 9. So if the patient carries this, 
as a part of their medication regimen. Obviously, we will get to know that these patients are at a high risk of encapsulated bacteria, so they should be appropriately covered and treated for that right up front rather than delaying. Talking about some interesting yes. oral infections. Yes. Just a last five minutes, please. You have to wind it up. Yes, Thank I'll you. have a few more slides, a couple of them. So, aspergillus is one of those which really show up in these patients who are high, high risk and get critically ill and respiratory failure. And that is just on those right subset of hosts. It's all depend, it all depends on what exactly is the host. It's the one with the active AML or MDS and ongoing neutropenia. And we are talking about profound neutropenic patients. So, they develop this nodular uh, lesion on this that we can see on the CT scan and we call it as a halo sign. And what exactly it is a mass like consolidation of the damaged lung tissue, but it's it not necessarily only involved the lung, it can involve the other body organs, particularly talking about, uh, you know, the cerebral involvement, digestive tract, aspergillosis of the cardiac tissue, thyroid, cutaneous, and uh, that part of the multi-system involvement of aspergillus. The diagnostics are always limited. Uh, when we talk about the other fungal pathogens, because obviously aspergillus, you may get beta D glucan and galactoman and positive. There's a whole lot of discussion about what's the sensitivity and what's the utility of these two tests. But understand that in case of fusariosis, zygomycosis, and hemocystis, your galactoman may be negative, so you can't rely on these things. And similarly, the DNA-based PCR methods are there to identify in the lab, but they are not standardized. Their sensitivity is all over the place, ranging from 36 to 98 percent. So we, the way we rely on the bacterial early detection methods by using PCR, we can't rely uh, on the same methods when it comes to uh, fungal infections. And we know that in case of fungal, we probably have to rather focus on mold adaptive trisoles, which is classically voriconazole, osoconazole, and isoconazole. Similarly, similarly, mucormycosis is another thing that I was talking about. Both galactoman and uh, one three beta duplan will be negative, and it, apart from the you know the extensive disease process, instead of using voriconazole, these are the patients we rather need liposomal amphotericin B to begin with. There's a bit of shift between the kind of infections they develop in case of solid organ transplant recipient, and it, it all depends on the duration since uh, you know their last transplant. Certain things are important because, you know, there are times when all these diagnostics are so ex uh, extensive and there's a time lag, so you may not know about them uh, right in the time period you want to know within like a day or two. So certain times the body, uh, as I said, the radiology of this uh, chest, similarly the brain, when it comes to MRI or CT scan, the involvement of the part of the brain may guide us that which would be the possible pathogen. For example, if you're talking about temporal lobe, we always think about HSV or autoimmune limbic encephalitis or HHV6 or things like that. Whereas if the brain stem is involved and it suspects infection as patient is clearly ill, think about an entire virus and listeria, things like that. Now, finally, all of these patients who are sick and you know, immune suppressed, not everything is all infection. There are so many other things that overlap. And I just lined out a few there, which include engraftment syndrome, we know inclusive disease, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, and all these things. So keep in mind that while you're focusing on infection, you make sure you treat these things. So I'm going to finalize the whole talk here by saying that it's important in order to better manage these patients, you need to have better understanding of what's the underlying predisposing risk factors. And that may be variable depending upon what is the underlying immune defect. And based on that history and immune system defect, you will have to focus on early warning signs and try to cater your antibiotic therapy accordingly. And at the same time, while you're focusing your treatments toward these infections, you make sure you be better understand non-infectious critical illness at the same time and modify your plan accordingly. I just had to rush through it a lot. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to... <laughs> answer a lot of questions for comments. My email is here. If time allows, I'm here. Thank you.